All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for participating in today's Home Performance Counts virtual green home tour. My name is Michelle Diller, and I'll be your NHB host and moderator today. Today, our series takes us to Santa Fe, New Mexico to see Modern Farmhouse by Palo Santos Design, LLC. Home Performance Counts is a joint initiative of the National Association of Home Builders and the National Association of Realtors, and you can learn more about that at homeperformancecounts.info. Please note that the session is being recorded and it will be uploaded for on-demand viewing on nhb.org in the next few days. Please note this webinar is copyrighted by the National Association of Home Builders and is intended to provide complete and accurate information on the subject matter covered at the time of publication. I'll give you just a minute to review the copyright and disclaimer statement. And then we'll move on to the learning outcomes. Today's learning outcomes are explore how the green building strategies and features of the home can impact its comfort, health, efficiency, and durability for the families that live in them. Discuss how to communicate green and high performance features to clients in a relatable way that increases customer interest and understanding and recognize the advantages of a strong builder realtor relationship in realizing the value of green in your next sale. Today's tour is just over 20 minutes and will be led by Mark and Leslie Giorgetti of Palo Santo Designs. Not only do they design and build Modern Farmhouse, it is their personal family home. The tour will be followed immediately by a live question and answer with session with Mark and Leslie, who will be joined by Kim Shanahan, a longtime Santa Fe Green Home Builder and former executive officer of the Santa Fe Area Home Builders Association. Just a bit of housekeeping, feel free to drop your questions at any time during today's presentation using the Q&A feature next to the chat button at the bottom of your Zoom webinar window. Both the questions addressed during the Q&A and any that we don't get to today will be summarized in a PDF and that will be available in the replay library with today's content. Now it's time for the tour with Mark and Leslie. Enjoy. Hi, I'm Leslie Giorgetti. And I'm Mark Giorgetti. And we're here in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And this is our personal home. I'm a real estate broker. And I'm a general contractor and a home builder. And this is a house that we built for ourselves. And our family. <laughs> we specialize in the design and construction of one of a kind custom homes and sustainable homes that have lots of different features like this one that we are looking forward to sharing with you. I'm Mark Giorgetti, one of the principals at Palo Santo Designs. Palo Santo Designs is an award-winning general contractor and architecture firm, providing in-house real estate services to suit any and all of your property needs. We specialize in fine custom homes, renovations, and distinctive commercial spaces in Santa Fe. The Santa Fe Modern Farmhouse, carefully designed by the in-house architecture and design team at Palo Santo Designs, this modern farmhouse exemplifies the elegance and simplicity of clean lines minimalism while incorporating many of the best aspects of the traditional pitched roof northern New Mexico compound. It not only utilizes nature's classical proportions within its layout and elevations, it also showcases the best craftsmanship Santa Fe has to offer with hard trial plaster walls and artisanal applications of stone, tile, steel, and wood throughout. Designed and occupied by Palo Santo Designs principals, myself and my wife Leslie, with our two young children, the house exemplifies the fusion of living functionality for a family, high architectural design, and exceptional craftsmanship. Panoramic views of the Jemez, Sangre, Ortiz, and Sandia ranges offer every room an exciting vignette of our dramatic mountain skyscape. The cathedral-like great room with exposed timber trusses accommodates kitchen, dining, and living in an open floor plan aligned to the central fireplace hearth. The room opens out both to the west and east with sweeping portals that soak the occupants and guests with breathtaking views. 
The home takes sustainability to the highest level with LEED Platinum certification pending, utilizing solar photovoltaics, energy efficiency, and rainwater reuse for both irrigation and toilet flushing. With its super insulated shell, passive solar design, LED lighting, in-floor radiant heat, and pumice creek walls, this is not your typical Santa Fe luxury home. This one-of-a-kind work of art has combined reverence for nature, architecture, and craftsmanship into a masterpiece, which will provide its soul-enriching lifestyle benefits for generations to come. Recognized as one of the best contemporary custom home builders in Santa Fe, we are proud to present our work again in the Haciendas A Parade of Homes for 2020. Being in the construction and real estate industry, we're really committed to building high performance homes. We really consider it just the highest quality that you can build. It's almost like a sports car or something. Kind of the wave of the future where the market's going. So we definitely invested in you know, all the systems, energy efficiency, water efficiency, healthy indoor air quality. We believe in that. We also believe the market appreciates that. Being a real estate broker, I have seen buyers who will pay, of course, extra for a LEED certified home. So we went ahead and we did um, solar PV. We did all the water recycling, water catchment, um, and gray water. Our home's pending LEED gold certification, and we're really happy to live here. Some of the things I really like about this home is that we were able to use um, low VOC finishes and, and um, uh, healthy indoor air quality aspects to the construction. We also have um, an energy recovery ventilation system that continually refreshes um, the indoor air quality through a HEPA filter. And um, we have birds that live upstairs <laughs> that you can hear. Another innovation that we're really excited about was the creation of the walls with a system we call Pumice Crete, which uh, is uh, a monolithic lightweight concrete construction that utilizes a local resource, pumice stone, as the aggregate. And so as you can see, these walls are quite thick. They're also very massive, and um, it allows for a very high thermal performance in the home. It's a very high thermal mass, which, which works well with our passive solar design. And it helps to regulate the indoor air temperature. We find it's very cool here in the summer uh, and also stays quite warm in the winter. That coupled with concrete floors and in-floor radiant heat and a super insulated building envelope uh, has allowed us to create a home that is passively quite comfortable.
we've been building green homes for about 20 years. And about 20 years ago, people would always ask, what's a green home? And I would try to explain that, you know, it's a home that has high performance, that has non-toxic materials. It's, you know, got good indoor air quality. And now certainly the conversation has evolved, the technology has evolved, and more people are aware of it. But, you know, there's still some gaps in the knowledge. And as a mother, you know, you naturally care about your family, their, their health, and that extends to caring about the greater planet, the resources that go on to support your children, your grandchildren. So, you know, it's really about taking care and doing it right. That's the way I see building a green home. For instance, you know, all the materials in our home are low VOC or no VOC, which means they're volatile organic compounds, which can cause cancer, um, other issues with breathing, just general toxins, right? So of course, anybody who cares about their family and their health should care about these things. Sometimes people just aren't aware or they don't know, you know, how to find these kind of materials. So we really take that to heart. All the paints, all the glues and the cabinets. We even actually, you know, take it down to the furniture in our house. Um, so that's really important to us. And then, you know, naturally living in the arid Southwest water is a big deal. I like to garden. I want to be able to grow fruit trees, even have grass for my children, be it a small patch of grass. But, you know, I don't want to feel guilty about taking fresh drinking water and using it to grow grass with or even trees. So, so that's one of the reasons we go to such a great length to water recycle. It makes me feel good that I'm doing the right thing. And now, technology is advancing far enough that we have so many electric cars, solar's come a long way, you know, we build all electric houses even. So it really is just a matter of care. It's about caring, truthfully. And what I also like about it is it, it's not really out of people's wheelhouses. Like the non-toxic finishes, like it's so easy to get non-toxic paint, like low or no VOC paint. Every hardware store carries it. Even getting no VOC cabinets, super easy. A gray water system is one of the most simplest, easiest symptom, uh, systems to install. It's just a basic pipe you can get at Home Depot and Thomas. So sometimes people just have a lot of barriers to understanding. They think it's maybe hippie or they think it's not going to be elegant or graceful or they think it's difficult to achieve um, so it you know it really isn't it's really more about education and understanding why do it really it, it the why is because you care about yourself you care about your family you care about the environment you care about having resources for the next generations really Another thing we're quite happy about is that we've got a five and a half kW solar grid tide system that we've mounted on top of the garage building, which is feeding power back into the grid. And in New Mexico, we have a net metering agreement with our local utility company that allows us to offset 100% of the electricity we consume here with solar. Let's go take a look. So here we've got the typical utility meter that most people are familiar with and this is measuring how much energy we're consuming on a daily basis. Um, that's our main panel for the house. And then here we have a utility disconnect which is a safety device that separates the solar from the utility grid if necessary. It's connected now of course. And this is what we call the renewable energy credit meter, a rec meter. And so this is measuring how much power we're producing from our solar. And if you see, there's a couple bars down in the bottom that are kind of blinking, uh, which is showing us that we're at maximum power right now. 
So inside the garage here, we've got an inverter. And this is basically taking the, the DC power that's coming down off of the solar panels and inverting it into AC power so that it could feed back into the grid. And it's a safety device also that will you know, turn off if there's ever uh, any issues. And it keeps track of all the power that we produce. One of the things I love about this home the most is its water efficiency. Here in the high mountain desert, of course, water is a big deal, right? In fact, buyers coming here from other places like California or Chicago, they really care about water and knowing that we have water conservation measures and basically enough water that we're caring for water. And so what we did at our home is we have roof water catchment and the roof water catchment goes into underground storage tanks and then it pumps into a drip system that feeds our irrigation. We also take all the indoor water from our laundry, from our showers, from our bathroom sinks, everything except the kitchen sink because it has too much particles in it. And then we filter that into the into our landscaping through what's called a pumice wick, which is basically just a large perforated pipe that's laid in a bed of pumice and it just leaches out into the garden. So here you can see here in our garden, this is where our pumice wick comes out, one of them. So it comes out right here. You can see this white plastic PVC pipe here. This is my husband, Mark, who will tell you more about it. And so this is a very simple, basic, passive gray water system. Uh, like Leslie just described, we um, bring all the water from our laundry, our showers and tubs, and our uh, lavatory faucets um, in through a dual drain system. And we bring it uh, through a valve right here, uh, which is underground in this, in this PVC uh, container here. And below the surface, which we can't see, there's a perforated drain pipe wrapped in a bed of pumice stone that um, basically allows that water to infiltrate into the garden beds here, feeding these fruit trees and these other uh, native drought tolerant plants so that we could eventually develop in time a beautiful shady oasis here in our south facing courtyard. We also have gray water beds in other parts of the home uh, so that we're utilizing this water in different places for different purposes. The other gray water bed that I was describing comes out of the house on this side, on the north side, and comes out along this uh, embankment and through the um, orchard, uh, again feeding fruit trees and increasing just the general greenness of this otherwise fairly arid environment here in Santa Fe. So additionally, all of our roof lines have gutters and downspouts that bring rain and snow water down into a below ground conveyance system, a rainwater catchment system. So there's a drain grate underneath the rocks here. And all of that is conveyed from every single downspout location in the house to a below ground cistern in which we have a pump that feeds our irrigation system. Let's go take a look at that. As I described, all the downspouts from all around the house come through an underground piping system and bring that rainwater to this below ground cistern. Um, and I'm going to take a quick peek in here and see how things are going. So, inside this tank, we've got um, a submersible pump that's used to pump water out of the tank into our drip irrigation system throughout the, the landscape. 
In addition, we have an autofill component so that you probably hear that water running. I just triggered it temporarily. Um, that is so that if the pump, if, if the water level in the tank is ever so low during a dry season perhaps, that the pump is in danger of running dry, the autofill automatically turns on and brings up a certain amount of well water just to get it to a level where the, the pump will be safe to run. Um, in addition to the basic use of this rainwater for irrigation of our landscaping, we're quite, quite proud to uh, tell you that we're actually recycling this water and bringing it back into the home for reuse. We filter it and we use it to flush toilets in the house. So it's one way that we feel like we're doing the extra step of uh, doing everything, frankly, that we can to make sure that this is a water efficient home. Many people really want to buy a green home. You're buying a higher quality home. It's got higher performance, thus the bones are better than an average built home. It has lower operating costs because it's, it has higher performance. Often they have solar. Like our home, we have all the water recycling and gray water. This, you're gonna spend less on water bills and energy bills. Basically, you feel like you're investing in a home that's not going to be outdated 10 years from now. It's a higher quality, higher performance, and thus has a higher value and is appreciated more. That's some of the reasons we see here in our desert southwest that people want to buy high performance homes. Um, I want to thank Mark and Leslie for showing us your gorgeous home and the property. And Kim, if you can turn your camera on, he's going to join us for the Q&A. There we go. Thank you. All right. Can you say hello so I can make sure everybody can hear everybody? Hello. Hi. Hi. All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, all right. We're going to take a few questions now. Um, audience, you can continue to use the Q&A feature in the chat button um, on the bottom of your Zoom webinar. And we've got a couple, and then I've got a couple that I want to open up with also. Um, well, we brought Kim along for the Q&A because he's a longtime Santa Fe green home builder, and he's the former executive officer of the Home Builders Association. So he brings, um, uh, also brings a good perspective about what's going on in Santa Fe in general and Santa Fe as a city because Santa Fe is a destination city to move to, to go to. I got to spend a week there for some classes and it was fabulous and I'm dying to get back. So, um, but I'd like Kim to talk a little bit about Santa Fe as a sustainable city. Santa Fe's got a 25 year plan. In 2020, the US Green Building Council awarded the city of Santa Fe with LEED Gold certification as a city. So the city's really working to make sustainability an integral part of the lifestyle. And can you guys talk about um, how that's really helping the home building industry, how that plays into it, how you guys all work together for that? Well, sure, I'll start. Um, you know, when I started running the Home Builders Association in 2008 is when I first met Mark Giorgetti and he had just started Palo Santo Designs. Um, most of us who had been in the business were collapsing our businesses and failing. And Mark uh, was brave enough to get going about that time. But I also knew at the time that he had um, done an internship, if you will, or worked with a very uh, famous architect in our world named Paula Baker, who wrote a book called The Prescriptions for a Healthy House. Uh, she wrote that in the, I'm gonna say the uh, early 90s. And it was really the first book that was out there about healthy homes. And I know, Mark, that um, I'm not sure if you were necessarily drawn to Santa Fe with the opportunity to work with Paula, but I do know that it had a big Im impact on your thinking, uh, working with her as an architect, not just in her healthy homes, but also her, her philosophy about how homes should be built. And it really is something that is also emerging um, in the world of the NHB, and it actually may be even uh, part of uh, one of the questions that we've got coming in in our chat room. So talk a little bit, Mark, about what it was that drew you to Santa Fe and, and whether or not you believe that what drew you is also still continuing to draw people to Santa Fe. 
Uh, well, thanks, Kim. And yeah, actually, in fact, I originally, I moved to Santa Fe in um, 1997, I believe. And the, re the reason I moved here was to work with Paula and her husband, Robert Laporte, uh, who were teamed up at the time, <clears throat> um, building um, in what they called eco nests, or these like uh, super sustainable homes with natural materials and uh, healthy healthy building products like you're referring to. So um, yeah, and my background before that was in environmental science and in um, the solar industry. Uh, and so I kind of, I came to, to Santa Fe and Taos also, uh, I was drawn to the, the idea of the earth ships, uh, which some people may be familiar with, um, kind of a very local vernacular style of construction from Taos, New Mexico, uh, very sustainably oriented, passive solar design, use of recycled materials, um, and so all of that was just sort of congealing as, as a, um, a way by which, um, you know, as, as a young person who was, uh, you know, somewhat capable and, and um, um, uh, you know, interested in the building trades, uh, a way to express environmentalism and a healthy lifestyle uh, through production. And you know, it's, it has just, you know, snowballed, uh, you know, since then and, and uh, you know, the, started our own company actually in 2001. So a few years, you know, before we met Kim, but, but all the same, um, you know, like you said, like coming, coming kind of uh, into it during the great housing recession and then, you know, the years after that, um, but always kind of holding this thread of sustainability and um, you know, solar and um, instruction as a uh, as a venue to do something meaningful, uh, you know, in, in terms of environmental stewardship. And uh, you know, the building sector is one of the largest uh, you know, contributors to water use, energy use, uh, waste stream. <clears throat> so it's also uh, one of the greatest opportunities that we have to reduce uh, energy consumption, greenhouse gas emissions, conserve water, conserve resources. So, you know, it's, it's a very dynamic uh, uh, industry to be in. It's constantly changing. I mean, right now it's going through its own new and different set of <clears throat> challenges, um, different than the ones from the recession, but uh, all the same, uh, lots of challenges still abound. And so there's always opportunities for innovation, for, you know, as a designer also, uh, I really thrive on the, uh, the opportunity to create new one-of-a-kind product and, and um, use um, innovation and technology, um, especially from the perspective of sustainability, to just constantly improve the product and the, and the types of projects that we, we get to do. Great, thanks for that, both of those perspectives. Um, Leslie, do you have anything to add? Or I'll go to another question. Yeah, you can go ahead. <laughs> it's up to you. Um, we had a comment complimenting you on your gorgeous home for one, but um, somebody especially loves the gravel walkways and wanted to know what kind of suggestions you have for materials to use in creating these types of natural paths. Well, we build ours by, um, you know, we'll often use like a hose to kind of lay out like a curving path. And then we'll w lay down weed fabric and select a gravel that's usually a smaller size. We were using like a pea gravel. They're kind of smooth and round at our home. And that's how we, we do it. We'll use rocks or metal edges usually to create our borders. Okay, great, thanks. Let's see, what else do we have? Those, um, uh, those, gravel, yes. those gravel driveways, by the way, also percolate water. And rather than uh, right. shedding, shedding water up a concrete pathway, um, it, it helps infiltrate that water into the, uh, into the ground. It does. And that is a perfect segue into another question about the rainwater gray water system that you guys have at the house. Um, got a couple questions about that. I'll throw the questions out and then let you guys talk about rainwater gray water. Um, 
So for one, for you, for how long have you been in the home to see how it's operating? And did you preload the system before you guys moved in? If so, for how long so that it was ready to go? And have you needed to be supplementing the rainwater and gray water with the well? You mentioned having a well. And if you've had to supplement, is that seasonal or is it just, you know, depending how it's going? And then the final piece of that kind of, and I'll, I'll go back over them if you forget half of them, um, the design treatment requirements that you guys have to be able to bring the water back into the house to use it to flush the toilets. Yeah, well, um, the, the, so just to clarify, the rainwater catchment system is its own standalone system, totally separate from the gray water system. So those are two different and, and separate um, approaches to, to water conservation, um, gray water, being a way to reuse wastewater uh, for landscaping purposes in the <clears throat> rainwater, we're catching rain off the roof. Um, and uh, we've been in the house for just over a year. Um, so we've definitely seen it go through the whole cycle. And for irrigation, you know, landscape irrigation purposes, um, you know, during the majority of the year, other than like the real intense part of the summer, like where we are now, uh, other than you know, three months or so in the summer, it, it pretty much, we've been using rainwater pretty much exclusively for the landscape. This time of year though, A, we haven't had much rain, uh, although a little bit, and um, and B, it's just, you know, the hot, hot, dry part of the year. So uh, the plants need more water. And, uh, you know, in, in a way it's sort of like, much like our, uh, the analogy of, of our solar system, you know, it's a grid type system so we're producing energy and feeding it into the grid this time of year we're producing more energy than we're using because the days are long and the sun is out uh, in the winter it's the opposite we're using more than we're producing but on a net basis it's kind of you know hopefully some place close to zero and like it probably will be um, with the water you know we hope that it's kind of a, a similar type of thing or we may be drawing off the well for irrigation in the in the main, you know, intense months of the summer to a degree, but then on the shoulders of the, you know, spring and, and fall, we can rely just on what the catchment has to, to take care of the rest. So. Okay. And before you guys moved into the house, did you start, did you start building the rainwater system? Did you start lo loading it up while the house was under construction or did it start operating when you moved in? Um, well, it was during construction. Um, we actually installed the cistern pretty early on in the construction time just because of the way we were dealing with the site construction. It made sense to do that. Um, the actual conveyance of the downspouts to the tank was one of the last things that we did before we completed. So it really only um, was functional towards the end of the construction. Um, and yeah, we did fill it up um, partially when we installed the tank, just because that's a way of keeping it from collapsing or anything. So it always had some well water to, to start with, but, uh, but the tank, uh, you know, up until recently was uh, nearly full, you know, into, into May, it was full. And uh, now, you know, we're using a lot more of the water because of the season, but um, that's just the nature of it. Okay. We, we pray for monsoon season in um, July and August in Santa Fe because that's when we get the, the maximum amount of our rainwater. Um, and as Mark said, right now we're just sort of hanging on, hoping for the rains to come. There you go. Yeah, getting close to July. So rainwater catchment is not something that is used across the entire country at this point to a great extent. It's, it's obviously a great tool in the Southwest. Um, do you have any suggestions on for in other areas? Because obviously it can be used. It rains all over the country. Rainwater can be captured off the roof and used. It's a resource that we have. Do you have any suggestions on how to sell water catchment systems to people who are building new homes in areas maybe that aren't seeing the droughts right now or where they don't think about it, like how to bring it forward in their mind and sell it to them as an asset? Well, Michelle, you well know, um, because you were participating in the Next Generation Water Summit we had in Santa Fe a couple of weeks ago. Um, one of the things that uh, Mark has not mentioned is that he has zero stormwater runoff on his lot. 
there is no erosion occurring because of rainwater coming off his roofs. And in very many places in this country, that's a huge concern, especially if you happen to live like some of you do out in the uh, Chesapeake Bay, where you may be fined if the rainwater hits your roof, hits your property, and then runs into the Chesapeake Bay or the estuaries around there. So to the extent that people can harvest their rainwater and flush their toilets, even if they don't, even if they live in an area where they got plenty of water to flush toilets, um, it does mitigate that stormwater runoff that is an issue in so many parts of the country. Mark, I don't know if you got any thoughts about that, but as one of the things that uh, we've been talking about as we talk to other builders around the country about why do this, obviously it makes a lot of sense in the uh, Southwest where we are in the 22nd year of a drought, um, but there is applicability in some other markets as well. Yeah, and I think local um, ordinances that play a lot uh, in in how and how you can and or cannot use rainwater. I mean, in our neighboring state in Colorado, I know there um, are serious restrictions on being able to catch water because of their water rights laws. Uh, whereas in New Mexico, or at least in in Santa Fe County and the city of Santa Fe, um, it's a requirement by code that we have to catch water and reuse it. So, you know, different regions will have different uh, criteria that builders are going to have to address um, and be aware of. Right, but, great. you know, from a saleability point of view, um, it, it's a no-brainer in any of the arid climates, uh, you know, in the western states especially. Um, but, you know, it, it's kind of going back to what Leslie was saying uh, in the video, just uh, have it, you know, bringing forward a certain level of care, you know, about, um, about the environment, about forest conservation, and more and more people who are uh, coming of age, uh, ready to build or buy homes, um, millennials, and, you know, other people who are um, you know, new to the housing market are really looking for these types of features. Yeah, I think of it like um, a couple ways, like Mark said, in that you're, it's like resource efficiency. You're not using drinking water to water your plants outside, or you're using roof water catchment to flush the toilet. So you're, you know, saving resources and energy and in, in creating drinking water to use for those sources. And then also, um, you know, we are seeing kind of more, what do I want to say, drastic weather patterns. Places that don't always have droughts will have more dry spells and things like that. So it is also a way to have kind of like a backup resource for people. A lot of times people feel that way about solar and energy. Then you can have, you know, essentially kind of tanks of water on your property should you ever need them um, in a natural disaster or you know, just situations that arise. So that could be one way as well. I would think that might be a selling feature for people who don't live in a very arid climate. Yeah, That's and that, point. that water can be filtered, uh, treated with UV uh, and made into potable water quite easily. It's not technologically complicated to do. There you go. Hmm. All right. Thank you. Um, we had a question come in, a little different turn here. How long was the home building process compared with a non, <clears throat> excuse me, energy home construct, energy efficient construction home period? I'm assuming that's what EE means. Um, how long was the home building process, city licensing and permitting, the features that you have, I think the gist of this is the features that you have in the home, did that take it longer to get permitted and get constructed? It did not, no difference. Same process. Um, approvals, construction, all of it was um, typical from a timeline point of view. And what is typical in your area then or for the types of homes you build? Yeah, approximately a year, 12 months um, to build a custom home. You know, th this is obviously a custom home. Um, the majority of the homes that, well, I should say all the homes that we build are uh, custom, you know, one of a kind, um, tailor-made to the owner's preference and to the site that, that the owners have already selected. So it's a, 
a brand new design each time. Um, the design process may take anywhere from three to six months. The permit approval process may take a couple months. Um, and then the construction can take anywhere from 10 to 13 months, depending on the size and the scale. I mean, certainly we have projects that have been uh, more streamlined and other projects that have been more complicated and lengthy, but on average. Okay. Michelle, I see that we've got a question that's asking, um, what is the ERI of the home? And in Santa Fe, um, we still are under a HERS protocol, not the ERI. Um, and we have had it as a HERS requirement in the city of Santa Fe since 2007. That's been code. So I'm going to kind of twist the question a little bit, Mark, and say, um, what was the HERS rating before the renewable energy? Because I think you're a net zero energy home with the solar panels, but what was your um, HERS before you added the renewable energy component to your home? I am on the spot. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> okay, don't sorry. Know, but, um, well, we'll catch that in the Q&A PDF then. We'll have Mark look that I'm up. Gonna, I'm going to guess it was pretty low because yeah. those, uh, you know, those big, thick pumice creek walls um, don't leak any air. Uh, and they, as you said, they are great um, thermal sinks. Uh, as is lot that floor that, kind of <laughs> that you've got. I think it was in the 50s and I don't really remember exactly. Um, and I'd have to consult my HERS rater and now I have to go do my homework. So thanks, Ken. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but it is a net zero energy home with the, um, with the solar, right? Yeah, we're offsetting. Right now we're producing more energy than we produce, uh, than we consume. So you're in negative so, numbers. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. yeah. In the winter it flips, but yes. Okay. All right, fantastic. I'm going to pause here for just a minute. We're going to talk more about the Pumice Creek walls in just a minute, but we're coming up on our scheduled time. Um, Chelsea, if you could put the slide up, please. I want to be respectful of the, our attendees schedules, but Mark and Leslie and Kim have graciously agreed to stay till the top of the hour and an continuing answering questions. So everyone is invited to stay along with us. Um, if you do need to drop off, we understand. So I'm going to wrap, do a couple wrap up things here. Um, in case you are dropping off, the series is going to continue monthly on the third Thursday of the month at 3 p.m. And we hope that you will join us in July when we're in Ridgefield, Washington at Urban Downs to see the Gladstone, where Jared Martin of Urban Northwest Homes out of Vancouver, Washington, will lead the tour. This home is one of the first in the country to be certified to the 2020 National Green Building Standard, earning the highest level Emerald, as well as earning NGBS Green Plus Wellness and Universal Design badges. The project's also certified to the DOE Zero Energy Ready Home and EPA Indoor Air Plus programs. Um, next slide, please. Thanks. And if you need to drop off, please remember that today's tour is recorded and it'll be available on demand at nahborg.org in just a couple days. And you'll all receive a follow-up link, email with that link. In the meantime, if you've got any questions or feedback, you can email me at mdiller at nahb.org or nhblearning.org. Um, again, thank you to Mark and Leslie and Kim if anybody is dropping off. Otherwise, we're going to go back to the questions until the top of the hour and you can take the slides down. Thanks, Chelsea. All right, I feel like I just came back from commercial. <laughs> so um, we've got a few more questions coming in. And what I would like to, to um, go back to is those pumice creep walls that we saw in the video and we pulled a little construction video about. If you can talk more about the walls, what the performance characteristics are of them, what kind of R value we're getting, and then maybe also I'll talk about what is the optimum building envelope construction that you're using in the climate that you're in down there in Santa Fe. Yeah, okay. Well, pumice is a, um, a local uh, mineral resource that we have here uh, in, in northern New Mexico. It's a volcanic stone or ash. Um, and so it's a volcanic deposit that's readily available throughout, um, especially the Jemez mountain range, which is nearby Santa Fe. Um, <clears throat> and so it's a, it's a system that's been innovated locally here uh, for at least 20, maybe 30 years, I think. Uh, and um, essentially what it is, it's, it's a lightweight concrete system, concrete mix. And instead of sand and gravel as the aggregate, which is common in concrete, 
um, which is pumice aggregate, like a three-eighths um, aggregate stone. And, and anybody who's familiar with pumice will, will know that um, it's very porous. It's mostly air. It's so light, in fact, that it flowed on water. Um, and so, um, so, you know, our value or the insulative quality of a wall system is, is basically a measure of how much air is entrapped in the wall and that air becomes a um, barrier to the transmission of heat energy because uh, air is a very poor conductor. Uh, and so with the pumice, you have uh, thousands of these tiny aggregates that are basically full of air pockets. And as they congeal together in a monolithic form, you know, we sort of, it's a cast in place, it's poured uh, in place. Um, it, when, it, when it sets up, it has the consistency of a, um, like a Rice Krispie treat. Okay, basically it's lots of little particles that are glued together. Uh, and so not only is there each and every aggregate full of air pockets, but the, the assembly itself is, is also full of air pockets. And um, so it has this unique characteristic of, of having a high thermal mass because it's a massive wall. Um, we do, um, you know, 14 inches thick. Um, and, um, it, but it also has a, a relatively high R value uh, relative to the type of material that it is. So uh, we also will use two inches of rigid insulation on the exterior of the building um, as a substrate on which the stucco is applied. And so um, that whole assembly will give you rough R25, um, but it performs better than a R25 frame you know, conventional frame uh, building because it also has a very high thermal mass. It's very massive. And so it, it also um, can store heat. It, it acts as a heat sink. Uh, and so in the summertime, it has the, has the effect of making the space around it cooler than it would otherwise be. Um, and uh, in the winter, it can also um, absorb the ambient heat and like I said in the video, it regulates the interior air, um, interior temperature, the ambient temperature of the house. It kind of uh, takes the peaks and valleys off of what would otherwise be common in a frame house, and you get a little bit more of a regular baseline temperature, uh, which is a comfortable temperature. And so the need for for heating is reduced somewhat, and the need for cooling is reduced somewhat. And so it just kind of helps moderate that. And, you know, in the Santa Fe vernacular, you know, our traditional building style here is adobe. And so uh, adobe is a earthen block that's stacked um, and, and usually in a very thick wall assembly. And so many of the historic traditional homes and buildings in and around Santa Fe are made with adobe. And so there's a vernacular style of having these very thick, massive walls. And the pumice crete achieves that same feeling. You get these very deep window wells. Uh, when you knock on the wall, it just feels like a solid block. There's no hollow uh, feeling to it like a frame wall. And, you know, and to be clear, our house is both parts of it are frame construction and, and parts of it are pumice. It's not all pumice. But the main great room is a pumice crete structure. And um, it's noticeably uh, cooler this time of year than the rest of the house. So Mark, Even with when, the high uh, ceilings in there. Mark, 25 years ago when I built uh, a Pumice Creek house out uh, south of town, um, one of the things that we were drawn to was the fact that um, we didn't have to do any kind of uh, chicken wire or lathing on the inside, that, that that rice crispy texture that you mentioned, our first base coat of uh, plaster just adhered beautifully to that. And I don't know if that's still the case 25 years later. Is that still true? Yeah, it is still true. Yeah, I mean, we did some laughing around the corners and stuff just to make some nice crisp edges. But in general, um, yeah, I mean, in, in, in speaking to some people who may still be in the audience who are unfamiliar with this technique, I mean, there's no drywall on the inside of the pumice creek wall. You know, it's, it, it, it's 
plastered in, we use traditional three coat plasters, um, you know, right onto the pumice wall. And you could technically do that on the outside as well with a stucco system. We choose to use some rigid insulation though, just to bring that energy performance to the, to the highest level. Um, you know, but for a very small home, um, as a matter of fact, the photograph behind me is another home that we built um, almost 10 years ago, and it's a pumice creed home. Um, and we did not uh, put any rigid insulation on that home. That one was also certified as a lead platinum home. Um, and so, you know, there's different options in how you can, um, you know, improve that thermal performance. And depending on the overall scale of the house, the one in the photo behind me is a uh, much smaller home. It's uh, only 1,500 square feet. And so it was small enough that we were able to get a very good HERS rating and energy performance out of it without having to add um, any additional insulation to the walls. Got another question for Leslie. Um, one of the things about this home that you didn't mention, but folks may have noticed when they're looking at the video, is that um, you have a colored concrete floor. And, and Palo Santo Design sort of specializes in these beautiful hard trowel colored concrete floors. Um, some people might think, well, you were trying to save a buck, which you did relative to tile and things. But it also, Leslie, really speaks to the uh, indoor air quality of this home. And as probably the person who has to deal with those floors, maybe even more than Mark, um, now that you're actually living in it, I'm wondering <laughs> when you think of colored concrete floors. Um, well, I know that buyers and our clients really are attracted to colored co concrete floors. They're durable, um, you know, they're really uniform, there's no grout, um, you know, so they're, I think they tick a lot of boxes for people, really, and they're the, it's a finished slab, essentially, so they're also practical and affordable, too. So I like them a lot, you know, with dogs and everything like that. I think they're they're great and they're beautiful and they, the radiant heat's right in the floor and in the summer they're nice and cool and you're not worried about the dogs scratching the wood floors. You let the kids skateboard on them? I let them scooter on them. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That speaks to the durability right there, so. <laughs> Yeah, my great room's like a scooter rink. <laughs> <laughs> that would have made great video too. Um, there's a couple more questions I'm going to get to before we get to the top of the hour. Um, and this one has been every month we get this question pretty much given what's going on with the times right now is, and Leslie, maybe you want to start, everybody chime in just for a little bit. Um, where do you see the biggest changes coming in the future for green homes post-pandemic? Right. Or what are people asking for at this point too? Yeah, you know, I feel like the conversation, people are getting more educated. So, you know, we're definitely like a destination and boutique market. Um, so people coming here from other places often, often are pretty informed. So if they're building a custom home, they usually want to get all the bells and whistles, you know, because they know they're going to be getting an electric car in the next five years. And you know, so they um, they usually want to invest in all the extra features when they're building custom. But I also work just as a broker period outside of Palo Santo. And in our market, we have such, you know, strong building codes, green building codes and water efficiency codes that all our new home construction in the city, um, like tract home developments and stuff are pretty green. They're not always green in terms of like non-toxic materials and stuff like that. But I feel like the, um, the psychology that COVID kind of has enacted and the investment we all feel in our home and spending more time at home and our family and our health, I believe will just kind of have a ripple effect into what people want essentially in their homes. And thus they do, they will raise their, people are raising their standards in what they want. Many, many of the uh, clients that are coming to us now ready to design a new home are <clears throat> wanting to go all electric because uh, they want to avoid gas or, you know, any fossil fuel input to the home. They definitely want electric vehicle ch charging stations in the garage, 
solar uh, as a baseline part of the house. Um, and um, they also want like work at home space. You know, they, they want to have an extra bedroom office space that can be their Zoom background and their, you know, uh, their home. It's uh, work at home is now the norm, right? So um, I think that, that is probably here to stay for a significant portion of the workforce. Uh, maybe not everybody, but um, a lot of people are wanting to have that kind of functionality at home. You know, and the healthy house aspect, um, as I mentioned earlier, NHB is really trying to wrap its head around that in a new, in a new uh, strong way. And, you know, Mark and Leslie may take this for granted because they've been doing it for so long. But, um, you know, when Mark mentioned an ERV that brings in fresh air 24-7, 365, that is also um, blown through a HEPA filter, um, it's probably healthier to be in his home with all the windows shut than it is for um, hiking around outside in the pollen, for instance. So uh, kudos to these guys for really kind of leading that example. Because uh, I think it's something we're going to see around the United States as well. I, I want to just add as a real estate broker, you know, working with clients, people are becoming more and more informed. So now when we're doing, say, due diligence on existing homes that weren't built green, you know, we bring in inspectors to inspect for mold and rain on gas. And a lot of the inspectors now, they inspect for um, VOCs and formaldehyde and all kinds of like particulates in the air. So really the, um, the market's changing pretty rapidly in terms of what people expect in, in their home and their air quality and having a clean, healthy home, mold free, VOC free, you know, particle free, radon gas free, all those kind of things. So it's definitely at least happening here in our market. I don't know about other places. Great. Thanks for those insights. We are almost at the top of the hour, but I would be remiss, especially since we brought Kim on here for the Q&A. I want to wrap up with talking about Santa Fe and the Southwest and what a, what a model Santa Fe has been for building in a water-challenged area. Um, it's undergoing aridification. It's been 20 plus years of drought, as um, Kim has mentioned. The U.S. Drought Monitor shows 90% of New Mexico is in a significant drought. So that can be a challenge to building. Um, can you touch on We've got about a minute for you. Some of the steps that Santa Fe has taken to enable people to be able to continue to build homes in the Santa Fe area under these conditions. Well, Santa Fe County, for instance, where, um, requires that homes of a certain size must have water catchment um, tanks buried in the ground. Um, we have a WERS rating, a water efficiency rating score that you must um, achieve a certain score to be able to get a building permit and a certificate of occupancy. That protocol has now been incorporated in the National Green Building Standards of Water Rating Index. Um, so we recognize that if we're going to continue to build in Santa Fe and the Southwest, that we as an industry are going to have to lead on these conservation measures. Otherwise, our governing bodies are going to say no more building permits. And that could really happen. Um, so we really have to be at the forefront about this sort of technology and these, these thoughts. And I know people like uh, Mark and Leslie um, show by example. I talk about it, but they do it. And so kudos to them. All right. Um, yes, and I appreciate you guys showing us the home today. Did you have any final things to add? We hope it was helpful. I mean, it's uh, it's one example. And uh, if he has any other follow-up thoughts or questions, everyone has our contact. So feel free. Great. Thanks, Jess. Chelsea, if you put that last slide up for us again, we're coming, we're at the top of the hour. So we're at the end of today's session. Already, um, I'd like to once again to thank Mark and Leslie Giorgetti of Palo Santo Designs for sharing their home with us and for Kim Shanahan of Shanahan and Associates for joining us to answer questions. Um, and thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Yes, Michelle. thank you. I was waiting for the slide to come up, but I don't see it, but we saw it earlier. So, but there we go. Um, and everyone, there you go. There's the contact information. As I said, the replay and the Q&A PDF will be up in a few days and you'll get an email for that. Thanks for joining us and we hope to see you next month. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.